These two new ways of thinking changed history. They were faith and reason. Faith meant all the objective truths that we can know by faith, and reason meant all the objective truths that we can know by reason. What is theology? Theology is the study of God. You're listening to Reason and Theology, where both faith and reason intersect. Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, on a Tuesday night discussing the Glossa Ordinaria with John Literal, who is the editor of the Early Church Fathers Study Bible and also translator of the Book of Jonah. It is a commentary that was part of the Glossa Ordinaria, and you translated that quite a few years back. Isn't that correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's been a good while back, and you actually were the one that uh, talked me into Going ahead yeah. And publish you. yeah, because here I'm thinking you, you have a great translation here, at least great in my estimation. It's better than nothing, especially. And it's not available to the vast majority of people. And so I thought, why not just go ahead and put it on Amazon, publish it? And it seems to have done very well. So yeah. I, I, you know, before we maybe even talk about selective books that are part of the Glossa Ordinaria, maybe just kind of give us a broad overview. What exactly is the Glossa Ordinaria? Maybe if you can explain what the term means, its background, its history, stuff like that. Well, the Glossa Ordinaria is a 12th century glossed Bible. And the way I picture it is, it's a 12th century study Bible. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's made up of three key elements. You have the scripture text, which was the um, uh, Latin translation of the Bible, uh, the Latin Vulgate. Mm -hmm. And then you had uh, what was uh, you had glosses, which were like footnotes that you would find in a study Bible. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way that it was laid out was is the scripture text would be placed in the center of the page. Mm -hmm. And then the glosses would be placed around the scripture text. Right. And there were, Two different types of glosses. You had the marginal glosses and the interlinear glosses. Right. The uh, yeah the, the marginal glosses were comments that would be placed in the uh, side margins of the page uh, beside the scripture text, and uh, a lot of times they each of the glosses, each of the comments would uh, a lot of times be close to the passage of scripture that it was uh, commenting on. And then you had the uh, interlinear glosses, which were comments, shorter comments that would be placed in the uh, between the lines of the scripture text. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of times they were just no more than just a word or, or a phrase, and they would be placed over top of just certain words or phrases that it was commenting on. So you know, and um, it was uh, put together at the School of Loan, the Cathedral mm -hmm. School of Loan. Most of it was. And, uh, you know, there they had a, a large library of uh, the patristic writings. And so, you know, a lot of the glosses were taken from the early church fathers and, and other uh, writers and commentators during that period. Yeah, and I'm trying to pull up a, an image of it while, while you're, you're going over this, um, because I want viewers to be able to see um, a good example of it. Some of the ones that I'm seeing are from the 1400s, but I like the the format where you actually see um, the scripture, as you say, in the middle, you have your marginal commentary and then the interlinear commentary, and then sometimes some um, commentary at the bottom um, in footnotes. I'm trying yeah. to see if I can pull Yeah, up yeah that edition right there is much later. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, uh, right. It actually has a, extra glosses added in. Right. And uh, the commentary on the bottom comes from Nicholas of Lyra, his commentary. Mm -hmm. But uh, the original Gloss Ordinaria uh, didn't have near the amount of glosses that you see in that edition. Right. Whoever did that actually added in Greek fathers, you know, uh, interpolated, you know, amongst yeah. the, the, you know, the others, uh, the original glosses. Now, who, who are some of the, you know, individuals that you would see in the gloss? Who, who are the commentary, commentators yeah. that it makes use of, that you see frequently? Now, the one that's uh, quoted the most, used the most, is Augustine. Mm -hmm. But uh, you'll also find a lot of Jerome, 
the Venerable Bede, Gregory the Great, and uh, many others, you know, Ambrose. And it was uh, mostly, you will find just about all of them are from the Latin fathers mm -hmm. because, you know, with the uh, uh, language barrier, uh, you know, you just, they didn't have uh, access to many Latin translations of the Greek fathers. So you'll see a little bit of origin in there, but uh, most yeah. of it's from the Latin fathers. And and I want to say Alcuin had a pretty heavy hand in, in um, compiling some of the commentary. Am I am I mistaken on that, or is that correct? Uh, he's, uh, he's not. Uh, he didn't compile any, but he was actually uh, a source that was used. Uh, there were okay. there were definitely uh, uh, commentators and scholars from the Carolingian period, such as Aquin and Rabenus and Haimo of Oxir and. Um, uh, Strabo. So, uh, you know, they didn't just limit themselves to the early church fathers. They, they did uh, take comments and excerpts from later commentators. And even, right. uh, even after the ninth century, there are occasions where, you know, those are used as well. Right. And, and I think, you know, what I'm pulling up here on the screen might be a later edition, but um, you can see, looks like yeah, the that, scriptures... That that looks like the the rush edition of 1480. That's yeah, the, I think that's the first printed edition that, that you have up there. Yeah, it looks like it. Um, I could probably find out for sure, but here, so here you would have the scriptures. Here you would yeah. have. I guess this is part of the interlinear commentary, because um, I'm trying to see the interlinear commentary. Uh, well, maybe here. Yeah, in red, these uh, these parts right here where you have a red word above the actual text i i'm i assume that is the interlinear text and then you have the marginal commentary over here on the left so it would have yeah. stuff like the church fathers yeah that's, uh, yeah that's really hard for me to see on my yeah yeah it, you, you might not be able to see because it's extremely hard and i have it very you know blown up and it, it's very hard to see the red here but there's some red um words in in between the lines of the middle text so i think that's the interlinear commentary uh that you were describing i'll see if i can maybe pull up um leslie smith's translation of the glossa ordinaria from ruth because that gives a very modern um visual of what it would look like in english so of easier to read that <laughs> than the latin yeah. <laughs> but to me it's beautiful i i, I love yeah. the way the glossa ordinaria looks i love the entire concept about it where you have interlinear commentary um i i think it's genius because it, especially when you look at ruth um and again you can find ruth translated in um into english by leslie smith I want to say it's part of medieval translations or, or something like that. Forget the yeah. exact title of her her book, but you could just yeah, Google I think it's it for commentaries on on Ruth. Yes, yeah. yes, and so there's Jerome's commentary in there, among others, uh, yeah. from the medieval period, and in it, it also has a glossa ordinaria. But anyways, you have the actual text in the middle, the scriptures, and right above some of the words, you'll have interlinear commentary usually one or two words and what it does is it adapts or, or it kind of gives a quick interpretation of the text by pointing you to those words so when the book of ruth is talking about there's a famine in the land it might say of the word or something like that in other words indicating that these things can also be understood allegorically there was a famine of god's word in the land so not just a yeah. famine of food but a, an allegorical understanding of there's a famine of you know understanding god and his word in the land so you'll see these little um interlinear text that gives you that allegorical interpretation and it's fun to sit there and read the text or read the interlinear gloss and see what they do with it and how they're allegorically understanding it. But, and of course, they're not saying that there isn't a literal interpretation as well. Um, they're just trying to highlight the allegorical understanding. And then in the side, you can read the marginal commentary. You can read Jerome or Ambrose or Augustine and their commentary on the matter. 
to yeah. make that's yeah. a fascinating way uh, yeah. to read scripture. And and I kind of wish that we had that more today. Me too. Know, yeah, yeah I, I, you know, I, I know you and I were talking about this. It seems like almost nobody is aware of the Gloss Ordinaria. And the vast majority of it has not been translated into English. Um, but not only that, I, I'm just confused as to why this thing was discarded. Um, this used to be the primary commentary that individuals use in the Middle Ages in understanding the scriptures. Is that not correct? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah you see uh, scholars, theologians in their teachings and writings and their own Bible commentaries quoting the Gloss Ordinaria. Uh, many, many times, uh, Thomas Aquinas, you know, in, yeah. in his uh, Summa Theologica quotes it many times in his Bible commentaries, and and even uh, you know his uh, Bible Catena that or his Catena he did on the Gospels, he quotes the gloss quite often. Tell so, tell us about that, just for anybody who's not familiar with his uh, Catena or you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, yeah, t tell us a little bit about his Catena, Aquinas' yeah. Catena, just for anybody who's not familiar with it. Yeah, it's a it's a awesome piece of work. It uh, it's a catena on the four gospels, and he obviously had tons and tons of uh, sources to use uh, from the early church fathers. And what he does is he makes a commentary, and he links all these different commentators. He takes uh, the part of the explanation from each commentator that he wanted, and and links them together to form a uh, a running commentary on scripture. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I've never, I've seen the, you know, you had the ancient Christian commentary yeah. on sacred scripture uh, that's out there, which is a really nice catena. But when it comes to the gospels, uh, that uh, catena by Thomas Aquinas is uh, about the yeah. best I've ever seen. Didn't uh, was, John just Henry just Newman have a hand in maybe translating yeah. it or making it available? Yes. He, uh, yeah, he translated a good portion of it anyway. Yeah, I, I was looking at that earlier. And, and in fact, I think you can find the Katina online for free for anybody who's um, curious. I, I forget offhand which website has it. Do you recall? Uh, I've got a website where I, I do have a version of it. Mm -hmm. It's, um, you know, all you have to do is just Google Patristic Bible Commentary and you'll come up with my site. It's mm -hmm. just one of those three Google sites, but I've got a, a, a large resources, uh, large resource of uh, commentaries on the, from the early church fathers on mm -hmm. each book of the Bible. And I have the, the that. Yeah. Now, wh why do you think maybe the Glossa Ordinaria and the way it lays out scripture study, why do you think that might be a little bit more beneficial to individuals who are wanting to understand the Bible better than, say, a modern commentary on, on Scripture? What are some of the differences? Well, uh, compared to the modern, is you know, you have the uh, early church fathers and, you know, these early Christian writers. Uh, it's, you know, it takes that's their sources, along with, you know, some of the Carolingians as well. But uh, they're. You know, that you have their interpretations and you have uh, uh, the view of the early church and how they understood the scripture text, which is, you know, different from somebody that's commentating on it with a you know, 20, 21st century perspective. So, um, you know, there's definitely a difference there. And the way that the gloss was laid out, I think, uh, like you mentioned earlier, it's a shame that, you know, we don't have something today like that because, the way it was laid out is you could sit there and read the scripture text and without even having to take your eyes off the page, you've got comments from all these different sources, you know, especially with the interlinear glosses, you don't even have to take your eyes off the word of the scripture text and you're getting, you know, some assistance, you know, of interpretation there. So, you know, uh, just the way that's laid out, the convenience, it's very user friendly, you know, mm -hmm. Let me uh, see if I could pull this one up here. Um, let me adjust my screen. Here's a better example of what yeah, we were talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah you, you can kind of see this a lot better. Let me zoom in just a little more too. So here you have the text. 
Um, but then right above it, you can kind of see some additional writings. So these would be your interlinear glosses. So the individual would, would read scripture, but then they would also see immediately above it a quick one or two word commentary um, on that word that would usually give some kind of explanation of what's going on, whether allegorical or literal. And then in the side, you had writings of different fathers, uh, medieval and patristic. And I, you know, I would love to see us get back to doing this. If, if we're not going to translate <clears throat> the Gloss Ordinaria and make it available in English, which I think is number one priority for anybody who's serious with any kind of scripture studies, um, at least we should start writing our own commentaries in this style. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> here lately as as well yeah yeah I, I think it would be beautiful but you know I'm, I'm not exactly sure what what happened why it fell into disuse i imagine the protestant reformation had a, a pretty big hand in that um and then definitely historical criticism um probably did away um with the allegorical understanding to a large extent but um you even see and we were talking about this before the show you even see um, Bibles like the Dewey Reams Study Bible. I'm sorry, the Dewey Reams Bible. Just I want to say the Old Testament was published 1589, somewhere around there. New Testament 1610, if I recall correctly. And when you look at this thing, I'll see if I can pull it up here online, but it is about 3,000 pages and it is filled with all kinds of patristic commentary. It's kind of like an English version version of the Glossa Ordinaria, except it just doesn't have your inner linear glosses. Yeah. It, it just has actually, marginal. Yeah, you have some marginal, and then a lot of the uh, footnotes would be placed underneath each chapter of the scripture text as well. But uh, yeah, you see uh, some similarities between the Dewey Reams, the old Dewey Reams, and the Glossa Ordinaria with some of the margins on the uh, marginal glosses on the sides and, and then they really truncated later editions of the dewey reams they really took away most of that commentary um no. so that by the time you get to more modern editions of the dewey reams uh there's almost no commentary in there at all and, and i'm not really sure what what is the story behind that have you ever chased that one down no no i i really don't know um i don't know if it was uh because, you know, during that time, uh, there, a lot of those footnotes were done when uh, the Protestant Reformation, you know, right after that. And, that, you know, a lot of it was a lot of there's a lot of footnotes that are directed toward combating the Reformation. I don't know mm -hmm. if that was one reason some of it was phased out is, you know, I'm really not sure. Yeah. But, yeah, there's, there's a lot of very good footnotes in the in that old Dewey Reams. Yeah, I'm pulling up the Dewey Reams now, see if I can put it on the screen. Um, but it, it really avails itself of the church fathers in it tremendously. Um, I recall when I, because I have a PDF version of it. In fact, I, I, I have um, two out of three volumes down there oh, wow. of it in a print edition. Um but let me see if I can pull it up. I think this is it. You can see here on the screen. Let me scroll over. You'll have, you know, all kinds of notes at the beginning. And then it's filled with commentary here on the side. Uh, this isn't the best example because it's just the opening chapter. But usually there's a lot more commentary at the bottom. Yes. So, um, you know, usually lot, commentary there. So, yeah, a I'm lot sorry? of times it would be at the end. Yeah, a lot of times those uh, footnotes at the bottom would be at the end of each chapter of mm -hmm. the scripture text. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, here was a, a great study Bible that, that is in English and it's really still readable. If you look through this thing, you can still understand it, um, even though the, the, the language is pretty old. It's definitely still understandable. And and so, I mean, one could really still make use of it. Let me see if I could pull up another example here. Here we go. Well, this is the Haydock Dewey Reams Bible. So I want to say Haydock's edition took away a lot 
um, as as far as the commentary is concerned. But you can still see a relatively decent amount of commentary here in this one. But again, going back to what we're saying here, you have a commentary in the English language with a lot of uh, patristic material. So if you're really interested in something in English, you can't read Latin, um, like most of us, uh, you know, you might want to look at the original Dewey Reams uh, Bible, and it's available on archive.org. I want to say they have it in two different files, the Old and New Testament, but I found it before um, in one one version. But again, this thing is 3,000 pages, so there's no way to print it out into one study Bible. If I can find a printer who can print 3,000 all in, <laughs> in one binding, I'm going to put put that thing out and see if we can make it available. But I haven't been able to find that. Uh, a lot of those printers want to stop around 14, 1500. Um, so very, very shy of the mark. But yeah, so back to the Glossa Ordinaria, because I don't, I don't want to get too far off topic here uh, and get into some of these other study Bibles. Back to it. What what was its reception? Do, do you, did you see a whole lot of opposition to it when it came out? And I know that the Glossa Ordinaria took a while for it to compile. It's not like, you know, it was made available immediately, but over a period of time. Um, they established the Glossa Ordinaria, but was there a lot of opposition to it, or was it received pretty well? No, there wasn't. Uh, there wasn't much opposition. There was a little bit, but overall, it was considered to be a very authoritative exegetical work on the Bible. Uh, you see, you know, like like I said earlier, you see a lot of the scholastic scholars and theologians mm -hmm. uh, that it was used in a classroom and in, in cathedral schools, and uh, in fact. For centuries, even after it was put together, it was uh, hand copied many times, and uh, there's still a lot of those copies uh, found in museums throughout the world. And um, then, you know, you had the printed edition. So, you know, it was definitely for, for a lot of centuries, it was held to high esteem. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were a few haters at the time that uh, didn't, you know, that wasn't too wild about it. One of them, uh, was a man by the name of uh, Robert Amelna, mm -hmm. who was an English uh, scholastic uh, theologian. That uh, he was a student of Peter Abelard, mm -hmm. and uh, he wasn't uh, a fan of the practice of glossing the Bible. And I think I've got this sneaky suspicion that uh, Peter Abelard had uh, something to do with uh, Robert's perception of the gloss. But uh, with Peter. He was at one time a student of one of the compilers of the gloss, a man by the name of Anselm, mm -hmm. who was a schoolmaster at the Cathedral School of Lone, France. And uh, they kind of had a falling out. And uh, Peter even said that uh, talking about Anselm's uh, teachings, he said it was dull and boring. And so I don't know what happened, but uh, Peter Anselm kicked Peter out of the Cathedral School. Mm -hmm. So... You know, Robert, being a, a student of uh, Peter Abelard, uh, probably, you know, had uh, some of his perception was probably uh, impacted by Peter. So, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, Robert. And, and Peter Abelard, he, he wrote that book, Seek et Non, which means yes and no. And it was basically his his way of refuting the church the use of the church fathers by saying well you find church fathers saying yes to this proposition and then no to the same proposition therefore they're entirely useless at least that was my understanding of, yeah. of the purpose of writing the book so i, I could definitely see somebody who's influenced by that <laughs> not yeah. perceiving the gloss in a good way yeah one of the problems that he had robert had with the gloss ordinaria was he felt that students who were reading the gloss mm -hmm. weren't reading it for spiritual enlightenment, but more for uh, academic passion to be more studious. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he, he seemed to have a problem with that. And plus, he also was pretty harsh when he uh, wrote about the compilers of the gloss. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, accused, he uh, accused the compilers of the gloss of not having an understanding of the scriptures, nor did they understand the uh, glosses that they were providing for the scripture text? Mm. And uh, so, you know, you know, it's, he uh, came down pretty harsh on them yeah. and right. But, uh, 
you know, like I said, I, I, I think a lot of it has, you know, kind of goes back to Peter mm-hmm. Abelard and his following out yeah. he had with Anselm. Very, very likely. I could definitely see that. But, you know, the, uh, he was in the, he was in the minority for sure. You know, most overall, received it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there were many that. Uh, now tell us maybe uh, about the edition of the Glossa Ordinaria that we see in the Patrologia Latina. Um, you know, this, this very large multi-volume series, 220 something volumes, if I'm not mistaken, couple of those volumes is de- designated or dedicated to the uh, Glossa Ordinaria. What are some of the differences, if you're looking at the Latin, with that edition of the Glossa Ordinaria versus previous editions that perhaps individuals in the Middle Ages would have used? Yeah, yeah there's quite a bit of difference uh, between the two. In fact, scholars are very, very critical of that, uh, that edition. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the reasons is is the fact that uh, it was attributed to, to Strabo, and uh, scholars have determined since then that uh, it wasn't compiled by a single compiler, uh, Strabo, from the 9th century, but was actually uh, compiled in the 12th century at mm-hmm. the School of Loan. But uh, he attributed it uh, to him, and that was the view that was held for quite a while, but uh, another thing that they're critical about is the fact that uh, the Patrologia Latina edition doesn't have the scripture text with the interlinear glosses. Mm. And that's uh, definitely a, a problem. And uh, another problem that they have with it, too, is, is he provides the marginal glosses, but uh, some of those marginal glosses are, are left out. And it seems to be that uh, the ones that were left out would be the ones that come from sources that would have been written after Strabo. So, you know, it seems as if, you know, the, holding on to the uh, Strabo as being the compiler, you know, even taking out some of the glosses that were written afterwards. I, I don't really know what the intentions were, but. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that, that was going to be my question. Why, why were they gutting this thing of, you know, so, so much of the material? I, I imagine quite a few, um, or a large portion um, was lost by just taking out the interlinear glosses. Don't, don't you think there was a lot missing at that point? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't been able to chase that one down as far as why that, that exactly happened. Um, Shame to drop the ball on that because that would have, uh, I'm sure that would have been valuable if they would have added everything in and and done it right. mm -hmm. Now, doesn't Brill have a Latin edition of the the entire Glossa Ordinaria? Yes, I, I've read about that. I, I really don't know much about that, so mm-hmm. I you know have much really to, that I can add to that. Because but, I'm uh, just thinking here. Look, if you're a translator, you know Latin, and you want to go and translate the Glossa Ordinaria, where would be the best place to start as far as Latin um, editions of it? Where what would you recommend? Yeah. Well, uh, there's actually one source. It's free online, and it's uh, it's a work in progress right now. Uh, Glossy.net is a website that uh, they're actually transliterating from the first printed edition, the the uh, Rush edition, and uh, they are um, uh, digital digitalizing it. So it makes it uh, a resource that anybody who wants to translate. And it's laid out really nice. So uh, glossy.net is definitely a place to, to go if you're interested in, in, you know, having a resource that makes it easier to translate. But uh, like, then... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, yeah. Now, the, the translation projects that I was involved in where I hired a translator to translate, uh, she actually translated from the that printed edition, that first printed edition from... 1480. And mm-hmm. so, you know, somebody with that knows Latin really well, that can understand uh, a lot of the Latin words that are abbreviated, you know, they, they can use that uh, printed edition and get by with it. In fact, you know, that seems to be uh, the kind of the go to uh, version that some translators uh, will depend on is that uh, first printed edition. But yeah, mm-hmm. if it like right now, if anybody was asking, you know, for something that can help them uh, to an easier resource to use, that Glossy.net uh, 
has, you know, everything's all the abbreviated Latin words are, are fully transliterated out. So it makes it a lot easier. Now, which books have been translated so far? Because it seems like um, from what I've seen, of course, you did a translation of Jonah. Um, mm -hmm. I want to say somebody translated Lamentations as part of a doctoral thesis. Yeah, I've seen the, the Romans. Act. Yeah, Romans. Yeah. Romans is another. Um, one. I've read the one on Song of Songs. Yes, yeah, uh, done by Mary have, Yeah, and then you have Ruth. Now, oh, yeah. oh, also, um, Sarah, um, you know, our, our mutual friend translated yeah. um, Revelation mm -hmm. and also one through three John, yes. or second and third John. Um, yes. I'm not aware of anything else. Are, are there any, have you heard of any other books that they're working on yes. at the moment? Uh, the Gospel of Matthew actually has been translated. I've seen snippet views of it. Mm. Uh, I need to look and see who actually the publisher is that's going to, to put it out. I don't know if it's out on the market yet. I haven't really checked up on it. But, uh, you know, the translation's done. Everything's been laid out really nice. Uh, I don't, you know, sometimes when it comes to publishing, it, it takes a long time to, you know, cut through the red tape and, and get some of that stuff out. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, the Gospel of Matthew is, is one that uh, we have to look forward to. And also, uh, there's uh, a friend of mine that I know who's a professor at Northeastern Baptist College, uh, Dr. Lee Williams. Uh, he translated the gloss on the book of Galatians, and he's uh, working on Ephesians as well. So uh, that's one that uh, somewhere down the road, you know, I'm looking forward to that coming out. Any Old Testament books? Uh, as far as I know, I, uh, yeah, the only ones I know of are... Uh, Ruth, Song of Songs, uh, Jonah. Uh, other than that, uh, none that I'm aware of. Mm. From time to time, I go and I do try to look and see if there's anything new that's come out. Yeah, <laughs> I do too. <laughs> it's a shame because I, I love the Old Testament. One of the reasons why I love the Old Testament is it's um, it's a wonderful place to go to to get the allegorical perspective um, in the allegorical sense of scripture, which is my favorite. Um, obviously you need all senses of scripture, but to me, the allegorical is most intriguing. And just for anybody who's not familiar with, with these terms, um, there are four different senses, arguably four different senses to scripture. There's the literal sense. That is the meaning that the author intended historically. Um, there is also then the, is broke oracle moral and anagogical allegorical would be how this text not only refers to something historically but how it also points to christ and his church um then there's the moral sense where we understand what happened in the literal sense to also have moral in moral instructions and implications for us as individuals um, or for the church. <laughs> well, back to what I was saying, I don't know what, what was the last part where I maybe got cut out, but I was talking about the four senses of scripture. What, what, did you hear all that part? Yes. Yeah. yeah now, you know, I don't know if you have a different. Yeah. I, I don't know if you maybe have a different take on it. That's how I understand the four senses of scripture. I want to say it's also mentioned in the Catholic catechism paragraphs. I want to say 115 through 118, there's a thorough explanation. And again, uh, there's different opinions on how uh, the different senses of Scripture can be divided, but essentially that's the most common one that I've seen, the fourfold method, which some people have termed the quadriga, uh, basically because the quadriga was, you know, a uh, old term for four horses that they had in the Colosseums and, uh, or not Colosseum, but whatever the, uh, the Hippodrome and they would have four horses guiding the chariot. So the idea is that these are the four, the four senses of scripture, which guide our understanding and interpretation of the Bible. So some people call it the quadriga. Uh, most people don't know it by that term. They might just know it as the different senses of scripture. Um, 
Now, let me give you a chance to maybe comment on that. Do you think that the fourfold method, that's the best way to identify this? Or have you seen something else um, better than that? Well, I've seen uh, some different, you know, I've seen Augustine discuss it and, uh, and Thomas Aquinas discuss it. But uh, no, I really, you uh, articulated that very well. You know, there's really not much I would have that, that could add. To I want to put that more. Yeah, I, I want to pull something up here, and I, I don't want to try to make it look I'm like I'm promoting anything uh, that I've done here, um, but I really can't find anything in English. So I had to just pull up an example of something that, that I wrote not too long ago as just kind of an idea for perhaps a future commentary, um, because I can't find Leslie Smith's translation of Ruth online. I, I can't find any screenshots either online of the Glossa Ordinaria that's been translated into English. And I was really wanting to maybe visualize this in the English language and not just bring up the Latin, but couldn't do it. So again, I brought up something that I wrote, but that is very much in the vein of the Glossa Ordinaria. So here, this is on the Book of Lamentations, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. So maybe this will help for... Um, by way of reference for anybody who's trying to understand the Glossa Ordinaria, here you have scripture um, in the bold text in the middle. Then you have interlinear glosses where you just have footnotes above each, and then you can see the interpretation of the footnote um, down here. And it, and it kind of gives an allegorical understanding of the scripture that we're reading here. Um, and you continue to see that all the way down. And then what we also see here is on the side, um, you see the marginal commentary. And everybody ignore the fact it says Jeremiah. I need to swap that out to say limitations. But um, here you'll see, for example, the literal sense. So you'll have commentary on the side marginally giving you the literal interpretation, then the allegorical interpretation, moral interpretation perhaps an anagogical interpretation, if there is one, um, depends on the commentator. Now, in the actual Glossa Ordinaria, they don't always give you these different, you know, all the different senses. They might just give you um, one of them, the literal sense or the allegorical or just yeah. a snippet of something from the church fathers. They, they might not break it down like this and say, here's the literal sense, here's the allegorical sense, here's the yeah. moral um, because those things might not even be applicable in all cases. There, there's, in my opinion, when you look at sacred scripture, um, would you agree that not every scripture has all four senses? There are some scriptures that might only have one sense or might only have two of the senses or some scriptures that might have all four of the senses. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, as far as the gloss of ordinaria and, uh, you know, the different senses. Uh, sometimes, you know, you will find that in a gloss and it all really depends on what book is that, uh, that you're on and, and uh, depending on who they had as their sources to, uh, to use in the glosses, you know, so if you have Gregory the Great, you'll, you know, a lot of times we'll find uh, his interpretations on, and the different senses that he gives on it. Uh, but you know, if you have a, a certain book of the, the Bible that uh, you know you don't have uh, sources that do talk about the different uh, senses of Scripture, then you know obviously there's nothing that they could have used to mm -hmm. to add. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Gregory the Great because his commentary on Job. Um, oh yeah, I want to say you compiled it, didn't you? I'm pretty sure you uh, compiled well, I, the commentary. I, 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 I did uh, edit it mm -hmm. at one point in one volume, mm -hmm. a very large volume. Yeah, and it is filled with the allegorical sense, is it not? Yeah. And yeah. I'm pretty yeah, he sure he has a lot in the moral sense, too. Yeah, well, yeah. He, he gives a, a, a wide variety of the different senses, mm -hmm. and it, it's an extremely valuable commentary on Job. In fact, the gloss ordinary on Job, uses a tremendous amount of Gregory the Great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are maybe some of the different um, church fathers that you think are very helpful when it comes to giving us these different senses? We've talked about Gregory. What are some other good ones that you've seen? 
Augustine, he's he's very good at uh, kind of balancing the different senses of scripture mm-hmm. and uh, in his writings and, and commentaries. Mm-hmm. In fact, you know, he even writes about it you know, on different right. occasions. Yeah, let me. Well, what what do you think, for instance, of Origin? Because from what I see, it, it seems like he takes the allegorical a little too far. But don't don't get me wrong, I like Origin. Um, sometimes I appreciate his allegorical interpretation, but sometimes it, he just goes way too far with it. Oh, Case yeah. in point, the Book of Leviticus. He just <laughs> yeah. anybody who's read that thing, he he's just on a different wavelength. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes he goes so far that it just it almost loses value. Yes, just because it gets so allegorical. It, yeah. it, as if he thinks that there is no there, literal understanding, literal sense other than the allegorical sense when it comes to Leviticus. Now, I'm I'm sure he probably wouldn't have affirmed that if somebody came and questioned him on it, but that's at least the impression the reader gets. Um, What do you think maybe about Didymus the Blind? I think that when you look at his commentary as well, I want to say he has a good one on Zechariah, but it seems like he's also one of those guys who kind of goes a little far. Have you had the chance of reading him yet? Oh, yeah. Yeah. uh, You know, any of those uh, fathers from, you know, the Alexandrian school, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, that's where the allegorical sense that's where allegorical interpretation on scripture a lot of it came from mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah there's uh didymus and origin um uh, and some of the others so can be, one, you know. one that i'm thinking in particular jerome jerome yeah. in his commentaries that i've read um and, and he has some he has some really good ones on the psalms that i really enjoyed um, his commentary on Isaiah is also really good, but what and, and Jeremiah, what I notice that he does is he'll often give you the literal understanding, the literal interpretation, because he truly does value the literal sense, and he'll you know even talk about different uh, variant readings that he encountered, um, perhaps in Hebrew, so different variants and variations of the text. He'll discuss them. He'll give his most uh, his, his opinion on what's most authoritative. He'll give his interpretation of the events in their historical and literal sense. But then he'll come and give you the allegorical interpretation and explain here's how these things apply to Christ and his church, the New Testament, the New Covenant. So he doesn't limit himself to the literal, but he also avails himself of the spiritual sense. I don't know if you've read a whole lot of his commentaries. I know you for sure have read his on on uh, Jonah. Is is that the impression that you get of him too? Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. He he to me seems like one of the most balanced. Although I want to say J- Bede has on beat, and in my opinion, yes, he, yeah, yeah, Bede is you know my most favorite, and he's also in the Glossa Ordinaria, is he not? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. There's a lot of bead, especially you get into the book of Tobit and, um, mm. well, just even, you know, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, mm. A lot of, especially a lot of places where you don't have uh, many commentary and many sources uh, from the earlier fathers, you know, where bead actually, you know, uh, did write commentaries on. You'll find a lot of bead there. And then even when you don't have uh, much of bead, uh, they'll rely on on later sources such as Rabinus, right? His commentaries too. Now he was early Middle Ages, yeah. correct? Yeah. Well, he's a Carolingian, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So he what I've seen of- with with Bede, you know, you you mentioned his commentary on Tobit, and and that's going to be filled with a lot of allegories. So that's a really good example. Um, but but you see his commentary on the tabernacle in the in the Old Testament is also very well balanced between the literal understanding, the historical understanding, and then the allegorical. His commentary on the tabernacle in the wilderness from Exodus seems to be a little bit more oriented towards the um, allegorical sense. Um, But then his commentary on Ezra and Nehemiah seems to be pretty well balanced out between the two. Then you come to stuff like his commentaries on the pastoral epistles, and they seem to be almost entirely just the historical sense because you know there's a debate on 
can you use the allegorical sense in, in a New Testament, New Covenant uh, passage of Scripture? Ha have you seen that debate before? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and then there's also, you know, they'll do the anagogical sense where they'll take a New Testament and uh, something that it foreshadows of a future event. Right. You know, so, you know, you'll see kind of that spiritual interpretation going that way as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that makes a little more sense because in the new covenant, you already have the fulfillment of Christ in his church. Yeah, it's right there in front of you. So it's kind of hard to, to do an allegorical sense, you know, cause that seems to be the, you know, the normal literal sense already um, is to refer to Christ in his church, but you're right. You do have the moral sense um, where, you know, maybe perhaps gives, gives us instructions but then the anagogical sense, it points us to how this maybe is fulfilled ultimately in the eschaton. So that's, that's actually a very good point that I haven't considered. Um, now, maybe tell me about some of the translations or material, material you're currently working on. Are you doing any translations from the Latin right now or, or just still working on the early church father study Bible? Yeah, uh, the uh, study Bible is something I'll be working on for quite a while. In fact, uh, you know, there are sections, there's uh, sources that uh, I'll translate uh, for the footnotes and stuff. And, and I'm also, I have others that will uh, translate for me as well. Mm -hmm. So I've had a lot of help in getting uh, a lot of footnotes, uh, you mm -hmm. know, that I wouldn't have got otherwise. Right. But uh, now there is a translation that I published a little while back of a uh, Ambrosie Astor mm. Uh, a fifth century commentator. He actually wrote commentaries on the Paul's epistles, but also he wrote a work. It's uh, questions on the old new testaments mm -hmm. where he takes a lot of the passages throughout the scripture text that are hard to understand. And, and he does like a question and answer format. So <clears throat> that's on the market as well. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, so, but uh, no, I would, you know, I, in fact, uh, if there's people that's watching that knows Latin, you know, it would be nice if, you know, we can kind of talk them into yeah. maybe getting her interested in lots of an area. And, uh, you know, if anybody's, you know, knows how to translate Latin and is interested in, in uh, a translation project, there's a lot of the gloss ordinaria that, that can be translated. That's true. That's very true. I know Ryan Grant, who was on our show not long ago, he's translated a lot of Robert Bellamy. Maybe maybe we can call on him and recruit him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. He's very <laughs> competent in Latin, so I'm sure he could do a little bit for us. Me, I'm chomping at the bit for more. I Ever since I read um, the commentary of the Gloss Ordinaria on the Book of Ruth, I was hooked. Again, anybody who's interested, go to Amazon.com. You can find this thing on there. It's really cheap, maybe $5. And you're getting Jerome's commentary and quite a few others. But you'll see what I'm saying there in that commentary. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. So I've been waiting for more on Genesis, Exodus, you know, the Pentateuch, you know, territory that's ripe for the allegorical sense. Uh, but just yeah. doesn't seem to be a whole lot of interest yet. Now, I mean, coming back to your early church father's study Bible, um, tell me a little bit more about that. Are you going to have a lot of um, a lot of material in there that hasn't been translated yet or mostly stuff that's available? You're just compiling it. And who are some of the fathers that you have in there? Yeah, there's there's definitely a mix. There's a lot that <clears throat> that's uh, translating for the footnotes. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's you know never been translated before. Mm -hmm. But it really depends on what book of the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of I like to kind of go in the spirit of the gloss ordinaria, and and uh, uh, you'll find when whoever when they compiled certain books of the gloss ordinaria, they would have kind of a primary source, mm -hmm. uh, say the book of Galatians, you know, primary source, and then you'll have other commentators as well. I kind of follow that pattern a little bit. Uh, just like with mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the footnotes that I provided for the Gospel of Matthew, uh, mm -hmm. Jerome's commentary on Matthew is kind of the primary source. So uh, there is an existing translation of that, but uh, I've actually translated from his uh, text and uh, provided footnotes from him there. But uh, 
but you know, it, it's a mix. It's uh, yeah. as I go, and I'm selecting the comments, uh, the footnotes. You know, I, it depends on which ones I, I find most insightful, which is articulated the best. And but uh, the others, you know, I try to try to make a good blend too. I, I want uh, readers to uh, see a lot of different uh, sources being used. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when can we expect this? And, and is it going to be multi-volume series? How, how is that going to work? Uh, the New Testament will be one volume, and that'll be uh, published first, hopefully in April. That's uh, what I'm shooting for. And then be working on the Old Testament, and that'll probably that'll take a little while. What base and, text uh, are you using? Just the King James Version. I'm going to ahead and mm-hmm. just uh, use the King James Version. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Are just the Deuterocanonicals going to be in the, the Old Testament? I, I plan on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, you know, I definitely plan on it. Yeah, that, that's always the tough thing is is trying to find commentary on the Deuterocanonicals oh, yeah. in know, English. That's, you know, that that's the yeah. difficult part. That's uh, that's where I hope uh, somewhere down the road I'll, I'll be able to get some more uh, people to help kind of translate and mm-hmm. uh, some of these... You know, because, you know, you get into Maccabees and, and books like that, it's hard to find and, you mm-hmm. know, commentary. About your earliest source would be uh, Raven Oos. Yeah. And uh, so a lot of his stuff has never even been translated in English before. Yeah. So, but I, I've enjoyed him from, from what I've seen. He seems to be a really, really good commentator. Well, yeah, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, um, hey, go ahead and, and put in a plug for any other material that, that you're doing. I, I want you to, you know, ha- have a chance to put everything out there. I know you have the early Church Father Study Bible that we're discussing here, but I want to say you have some other projects online as well. So go ahead and put in a plug for anything that you want. Yeah, there's uh, other English translations of some of these early Bible commentaries. Uh, there's Aquin of York. There's a translation that uh, I published that uh, is on Re- his commentary on Revelation. And also he uh, wrote a questions and answers manual on Revelation as well. And that's mm. uh, one volume. So that, that's out there. There's, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, Ambrose, he asked for his questions on the Old, or his questions on the Old New Testament. Uh, that's out there. And, uh, you know, Quite a few things out there, yeah. Uh, to put my John Literal in Amazon search and yeah, you know, all the pop up, all that stuff comes up for quite a few years, and yeah, there's it's quite a bit out there. And what's the website too? Uh, the website, if you want to just uh, get on to uh, a lot of commentaries from the early church, uh, just uh, put in a Google search "patristic Bible commentary." Mm-hmm. And uh, the website will come up in a search engine. It's just one of these free Google sites, but I've mm-hmm. I've loaded it down with a lot of resources. Yeah, you sure and have. It's, uh, it really the commentaries on, uh, say, from Chrysostom, his homilies, mm-hmm. and just uh, providing the homilies the way they're laid out, you know, in in, a, mm-hmm. in the order of his. Homily. I've got them all laid out to where you can click onto whatever passage of scripture that you want, and it'll have his comments on it so it's easy to pinpoint a certain mm-hmm. passage of scripture his insights on it, so it, i did a lot of it. is aquinas's katina on there too i want to say it is yes yeah. yes Excellent. that's in there too yeah yeah everything's uh you know divided up in book chapter and verse so you know it's, it's easy to you know navigate through i tried yeah. to make it as user friendly as possible yeah and yeah. it's a you know, it's a working process. It, you know, as I uh, publish uh, new commentaries and stuff, I, I even add that on. Mm. So a lot of stuff that I've, I've had published, uh, you can freely access on that website. Yeah, well. it, and it seems like people, re- you know, could avail themselves more of this because you have free translations of commentaries made available for you right here in the English language for free. So, I mean, why not use it? Go ahead and also tell us how how can individuals get in touch with you if they say, you know what, I know a little bit of Latin, maybe I can help out. Uh, How do I get involved in this? How how can they get in touch with you? Or if they just have questions. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just email me at jliteral29 at gmail.com. That'd be the letter J, then literal, L-I-T-T-E-R-A-L, 29 at gmail.com. Yeah, if, you know, any, if you need suggestions on, you know, about the Gloss Ordinaria, or, you know, need some tips or mm -hmm. uh, guidance on getting the resources to translate from, and, mm -hmm. you know, I would more than, I'd be more than happy to, to help somebody get started on a project. I'll definitely support as much as I can. Excellent. And hey, when your you know, study Bible comes out in, in April, let's do a show on it. I'd love to have you on again. Oh yeah. By the way, if uh, even it, if somebody doesn't feel like they're a, a professional at translating, you know, if it's just one of those that you just, if somebody's interested in and, you know, I, and just wants to, to give it a shot, then, you know, I'd be more, I'd just be as happy as helping somebody like that out as I would somebody that's a pro. So, you know, any, I think I feel as any, any English translation of the gloss that's out there, you know, I think it's uh, beneficial. And that's how you started out. If I recall correctly, I, I think you were telling me you were, you were learning Latin and you saw that nobody was translating the gloss. So you started just doing it yourself the best that you could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, sometimes my gets uh, ahead of everything else. No, you know? that's okay. But, uh, <laughs> but, because uh, that, that's how we got the, the gloss on, on Jonah. So yeah. it, it worked yeah. out well. Yeah, that was back then. That was uh, some years ago before a lot of these translations translations started coming out. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was one of the first ones out there. Yeah, I think you even had some correspondence with, with Leslie Smith when her, her book came yeah. out um, yeah. on Ruth. Mm -hmm. Ann Adder, she's another one. That's, she's a scholar that she's been very helpful mm -hmm. along the way. Um, it, yeah. Any idea, any word on, on any books that she's going to be doing by any chance? No. No, uh, she uh, seemed like she was uh, right around retirement the last time I mm -hmm. talked to her. And she was very helpful and, and uh, answering a lot of questions for me and, and hooking me up with certain other scholars in that field. Well, she but, passed the baton on to you. So. Yeah, she will. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it is amazing. You know, you know, you run into some of these scholars that are uh, well known that uh, – can be very helpful. They're very humble. So, mm -hmm. and Leslie Smith are definitely two of them that uh, yeah. I really admire. Yeah, excellent. Well, good deal. Hey, thanks so, so much for coming on the show. Like I said, again, when it, your book comes out in okay. April, let's do another one. Oh, that'd be great. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I appreciate you letting me come on. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for watching. Please comment, like, subscribe, share this material on your social media. Till next time, go share your faith. Thank you.